it's great to be back at Trent, um, and uh, it's great to be back at, uh, at Trail College, which for someone who's a proud uh, lady in graduate is, uh, is something to say. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it's great to be, to be standing not far from where my, probably my most challenging, at the same time, most um, uh, rewarding and favorite class uh, in all my years at Trent took place. Um, uh, some of you might remember um, Magnus Gunther, who was uh, um, a longtime um, professor of international political economy. Um, we called him God uh, at the time. Um, although we, we, there were two professors that we called God, um, one uh, was him in the international uh, uh, sphere, and the other was John Wadlin, um, who uh, all of you who are involved in Canadian studies will know. Um, and, uh, and I remember I, 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 I saw John uh, today, I actually met him for the first time because I uh, somehow went through four years at Trent without having a class with John Wadlin um, when everybody in my circle of friends uh, was studying Canadian studies and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, sort of worshipping the ground that he, he walked on. Um, so it was great to see him, him today too. Um, but I never uh, would have thought uh, back in 1991 um, that 25 years later I would be here uh, as a Canadian ambassador um, giving a talk. So it's, uh, it's great, um, uh, great to be here. Um, a big thank you to Professor Heather Nickel um, for inviting my partner Brian and, uh, and me to come to Trent this week. Um, and of course to the Frost Centre uh, and the Roberta Bondar uh, Fund for giving us the chance to come back to Trent. Um, I love my time at Trent. Um, it, uh, it really, um, I, I was sad when it ended. It certainly changed my life. Um, uh, I was, uh, uh, I tried to be an active participant of, uh, of TIP. Um, it's what attracted me to Trent, the Trent International Program. Um, uh, I did my third year um, studies abroad, uh, at the University of Granada in the south of Spain. Um, and that really cemented in my mind uh, that I wanted an international life. Um, and, uh, and so I owe that to Trent, uh, and it's great to, to be back. Um, when I was thinking tonight um, about, about speaking, uh, I, um, uh, I, thought, I saw this, this title that, that <laughs> Heather and I vaguely remember having this conversation a few months back and saying, oh, put something vague so I can say anything. <laughs> um, Canada and the International North, that sounds good. Um, uh, the, um, um, when I was thinking about, uh, about Trent and about being back here, um, uh, it's, it, it's funny, I, uh, the thought that came to mind um, was this slogan that was on uh, one of the Trent posters uh, that came out uh, while I was here, so it must have come out around in the early 90s, um, uh, and, it, uh, and uh, it, it, uh, it has often come back to me, um, and then today I saw it on the wall, framed on the wall in the, uh, in the President's office. Um, and I was going to paraphrase from it, but I, but I can actually quote it uh, now, uh, since I, I, I was going to scribble it down, but I realized that this is a university and now uh, people have technology, and so I used Brian's phone and just took a picture of it. Uh, and, uh, and it says the following, it says, at Trent, we believe that the quality of the future depends on two environments, the natural environment in which we live and the human environment in which we learn. Uh, it's a great photo of... Uh, uh, of the river uh, and the library, um, and um, and that uh, thought has actually stayed uh, with me uh, a lot um, uh, over the years, um, and uh, and I've think, been thinking a lot about it in, in terms of thinking about Iceland. Um, uh, you know, I think we've been very fortunate, uh, Brian and I, to have lived in a place um, where I think uh, the, the the strength of the country. Uh, and the society um, that its people have built lies very much um, in uh, an in-depth, if sometimes unconscious, uh, knowledge of both their geography and their humanity. Um, but I'm getting ahead of myself. That's sort of my big message for the, the night. Iceland does that well, and we should uh, take advantage of that, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll uh, dial back a bit uh, and tell you a little bit about our time in Iceland. and, and, and um, it's now three, well, it's coming on four years ago when uh, uh, we were in Ottawa, uh, back in Ottawa for one short year after being abroad for, uh, for six. 
uh, in far flung, far flung places. Um, and um, and really, uh, we didn't expect to 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 uh, to be posted uh, again. We thought we'd be, be in Ottawa for a while, and um, uh, and the opening in in Iceland uh, came up somewhat unexpectedly. And and, and uh, I was asked to consider whether or not uh, I would serve as, as Canada's ambassador uh, in Iceland. Of course, when you join the Foreign Service. Um, at least uh, in my case as a political officer, um, there is sort of only one objective to the career and that's someday to be fortunate enough to, 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 to be uh, in the right place at the right time with the right skills and the right language or whatever happens to be your lucky uh, mix uh, to, be, to be asked to be Canada's uh, representative. Um, so it was very exciting. Um, uh, I, knew a pla I knew the place a little bit. Uh, I had been uh, to Iceland uh, ten years before, uh, and absolutely fall in love, fall in love with it. Uh, I was uh, working um, for the Governor General at the time, uh, and had been um, with the Governor General uh, on state visit uh, to Iceland, and therefore had gone a couple of times in advance to prepare the visit, um, and uh, and fell in love with the people, uh, the place, uh, the the. the Sort of majesty of, uh, of 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 the physical space, which which Iceland is, and I think most first-time visitors uh, would say the same. Um, uh, the idea of uh, of being asked to serve uh, uh, in an Arctic Council capital, just as Canada was taking on the chairmanship of the Arctic Council, uh, was very exciting. Um, it's uh, it's always interesting when you're in the Foreign Service because you have this push and pull between wanting to be somewhere interesting, exciting. Uh, and sometimes I think if you're off the beaten track, it's better because Ottawa's not breathing down your neck and uh, you can actually be Captain Canada out there, you know, doing good on the world stage um, uh, without, you know, too many people paying much attention back home. Um, but, uh, but there's also this pull of, uh, of going to places that are high on, uh, on the priority list uh, at home. So going to, to a place like Afghanistan, um, uh, when it was the, the government's highest foreign policy priority, and then uh, being able to go to Iceland, just as we were taking the chairmanship of the Arctic Council, I thought that was pretty exciting. Um, also, I think for Brian and I, uh, as well, um, for us, uh, being able to serve uh, in an Arctic uh, um, place um, was pers personally satisfying. Um, both of us uh, have ties to the north um, and experience living um, and working uh, in the north. Um, Brian, uh, most of, uh, of, of his life growing up in, in, in what are now all three territories in, uh, in, in the north of Canada. Myself, um, sort of having a divided childhood between Ottawa uh, and Yellowknife, um, but uh, then professionally uh, being able to, to, to visit probably more than half of the, the communities uh, um, that make up the, the three territories. It, it really um, uh, was a, an opportunity uh, to, uh, to work in a policy area, to, to be out promoting um, uh, a, a priority for, the, for Canada that had some personal connection. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and I always think that you, um, you're more authentic and more uh, real in your ability to communicate. Um, if uh, if that's based in some personal experience, so um, so we arrived just as Canada was preparing the chairmanship. Minister Aglukak was the first uh, minister to visit us uh, in in Reykjavik. Actually, two and a half months after we arrived, she is the, was the first minister to visit uh, Iceland in uh, in five or six years. Uh, so it was a, it was an exciting time um, uh, to be uh, ambassador in, in Reykjavik. Um, it seemed uh, that. Uh, that a week didn't go by that there wasn't something focused on the Arctic happening uh, uh, in Iceland. Um, uh, we were um, we were preparing the chairmanship, took over the chairmanship in the spring of uh, of 2013, and as many of you uh, will um, have seen, uh, Canada's agenda uh, came under the theme of development for the people of the North, uh, which was uh, an agenda that Iceland fully embraced. Well, all of the uh, the Canada's uh, Arctic partners did. It's the, the, the nature of consensus at the Arctic Council. But um, the ideas around sustainable development, around safe uh, shipping, healthy communities, which, uh, which were at the core of Canada's um, policy, um, ensuring that the human dimension was front and center 
uh, were particularly well embraced by the Icelanders um, and they were right from the beginning looking for opportunities to partner with Canada and, uh, um, and so it's been an exciting time. Um, Arctic issues have, uh, have been uh, the, the biggest priority of our tiny little embassy over the last uh, few years. Uh, when I say tiny, um, this is, uh, the, uh, the embassy, give you an idea, the embassy in, in, in Reykjavik is uh, the definition of what uh, uh, Canada calls a micro-mission. Um, I am the only Canadian uh, posted uh, in, uh, in Reykjavik. Uh, we have three uh, Icelanders um, who, uh, who provide uh, amazing uh, service, uh, both on the consular and passport side for, uh, for Canadians, uh, but also um, trade, public affairs, um, and we're very, uh, function, uh, very uh, fortunate from time to time to be able to supplement that, uh, and sometimes supplement it two or three times over, uh, with great uh, interns that we bring in from Canada and from Iceland, one of whom is here tonight, uh, Natalie Guttormsen, who's actually a Trent grad and uh, living here in Peterborough, uh, and um, an Icelandic Canadian, and I'll get to the importance of that in a, in a minute. Um, but. Uh, uh, it's been, um, suffice to say, a really uh, Arctic-focused uh, time. Um, uh, it's given us a chance to travel all over uh, Iceland. Um, uh, Iceland is a place, um, much like Canada in a way, that uh, if you are from the capital, uh, you probably have roots, uh, or your family has roots somewhere else in the country. Uh, and, um, and so uh, it, it can be very tempting in a, in a country of 300,000, 330,000 people where 250,000 live in the greater capital area um, not to get out very much. You can certainly fill your time uh, staying in Reykjavik. Um, but uh, if you're going to be the ambassador of Canada to all of Iceland, then you would really new, need to get out of, uh, of Reykjavik. So getting to the north, uh, to Akureyri, uh, which is really their, their capital of the north, um, uh, and the center of research and international collaboration uh, on Arctic issues uh, was really important. Uh, we went up in the first, within the first month of arriving and, and I've tried to, to, to get up there four or five times a year since then. But now um, the Canadian chairmanship of the Arctic Council is over. We passed the torch to the United States last year. Uh, we also have a new government in Ottawa. New priorities are being developed and rolled out. Um, and Brian and I are starting a new year, knowing that uh, at the end of this summer uh, we'll rotate out uh, and come home to Canada after four years um, and hand over to a new ambassador. Um, so that's also made me a little pensive uh, last, uh, last uh, few months uh, as we lay out the plans for this coming year. Um, uh, thinking back about what we've experienced, what, what, what I've learned, um, and thinking a little bit about Canada, the future of Canada-Iceland relations. And so, so when I was thinking about what to, to talk about tonight, uh, this is a long-winded way, and as you see now that I, I, I said I can be long-winded. Um, uh, <laughs> when I was thinking about what to say, uh, what to talk about tonight, um, I sort of thought, oh, it could be like era of social media, maybe I should do like a BuzzFeed kind of top 10 list. Uh, the 10 coolest things I've learned in Iceland, or the seven things you never knew about Iceland, uh, which could also be called why I think I, I'm the luckiest foreign service officer in the world, uh, or why I have the greatest, greatest job in the world. Um, but, uh, but I think what I've, and I, I did start thinking of some of those, but I thought, well, if I did a slide presentation, it's going to be you know, me in a hot tub, and me on a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> it could be very interesting, but that's a different, uh, different talk. Maybe called uh, Brian Stewart's Excellent Adventures or something like that. Um, but instead, I, I think what I'll do is, is say a few things about Iceland um, that I've observed and learned, uh, and how I think those uh, things position Canada uh, and Iceland uh, to be more than uh, the neighbors, allies, and trade partners. We are uh, we are um, linked by so much more than that, uh, and there's so much more um, that we could be doing. Um, really, it's it's how and why Iceland, despite its size should be a strategic partner for Canada. Um, one that we can learn from, one that we can share uh, with to our mutual benefit, uh, and one with whom we can do great things in the world in the advancement of common ideas and values. Um, everybody these days is reducing things to slogans and brad, brand taglines. Um, we used to have this one at the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs called Canada, cool and connected. I think it was just, it was all about alliteration and they had to find three words that had, you know, C's and 
people say, okay, well, that's true, but what does it mean? Um, you know, the, these days, uh, Iceland is using Inspired by Iceland or Iceland Naturally, uh, which fits the brand very well. Um, but if I had to boil down to one sentence about Iceland and, uh, and this, I, these ideas that have been sort of percolating in my head, I'd say they know who they are, where they are, and where they come from. And that, together, unleashes an amazing confidence uh, in their own creativity and, and their own ability to build and face uh, their own future. It's a bit, um, it's a bit antithetical, I would say, in, in today's globalized world to, um, uh, to be uh, somehow not seeing your future as necessarily uh, defined by connection or interconnection to the rest of the world. Not to say that Icelanders are isolationist at all. Um, but uh, after briefly flirting with the idea of joining the EU, which really perhaps was understandable in a, in a, in a kind of moment of weakness and uh, lack of confidence after the spectacular banking crisis of 2008. Uh, and you've got to just imagine, and this is a country, uh, small economy, three major uh, private banks. Um, so imagine in Canada, all six national banks going bankrupt in three weeks. 70% of small businesses across the country went bankrupt, um, uh, you know, and the world was not in an economic mood to be handing out uh, favors uh, or, or life, uh, life boys. Um, so you can sort of understand that, the, that uh, hitching their wagon to the EU project and, and a safe path towards a currency, which albeit the euro wasn't doing so well and perhaps this has done only worse uh, since then, seemed to be a logical path uh, towards creating some stability. Um, but they've now moved away from that. Um, and that's not uh, just because of a major political change in, in 2012 or 2013 uh, when they elected a new government. While that's true, the government did get elected uh, very much on, a, on an anti-EU accession uh, platform. Um, the, the, you know, the population keeps getting polled, uh, and they repeatedly uh, say 60 to 70 percent of Icelanders uh, don't want to join the EU. Um, uh, although 80 percent of Icelanders would like to continue the negotiations and see what deal they could get before they make that final decision. <laughs> so there is something pragmatic about uh, Icelanders there too. Um, no, and, it, and it's not this uh, sort of knee-jerk bout of isolationism that people have sort of decried in the, in, in the uh, response to, uh, to the global um, financial crisis. Um, but I think it's, a, in fact, a, refle a reflection of a, a basic belief that they can make their own way, um, that uh, they have been uh, out there on this rock uh, in the North North Atlantic for over a thousand years, uh, struggling to build a society. Um, and uh, and in, so in many ways, uh, these 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 core, core characteristics, uh, or those th that idea is rooted in these core characteristics of Icelandic society. Uh, so it's an interesting way to look at Iceland, uh, but I think also an interesting way to draw attention to some of the key differences or key reasons why Canada and Iceland would be so well uh, suited uh, as strategic partners, despite our, our difference in size. So the first area I'd say is uh, they're very clear about who they are and where they come from. Uh, Icelanders are the, are the descendants of Vikings. Uh, they call them settlers. Um, they do call them Vikings, but they, uh, but they prefer to talk about the settlement of Iceland. Um, uh, they are um, uh, pragmatic in their ability to uh, define themselves and redefine themselves, uh, especially with the advent of DNA technology uh, and uh, the success of a, a, an amazing, an amazing uh, company. Uh, uh, called deco, deco genetics uh, in Iceland, which essentially, if you think, you know, people people always say the Canadians are deferent to authority, and you know, there's this joke that if uh, if you want to get um, Canadians to get out of the pool, you say get out of the pool, and they'll get out. Um, uh, Icelanders were all mailed uh, a, a sort of kit that said, take a swab of your DNA from inside your mouth, put it in this thing, and send it back to us. And they all did. And so one company, which happens to be a private company, but you know, is doing things in the, for the greater good of society, um, has the entire genome of Iceland mapped. Um, uh, and one of the things that came out of that uh, um, innovative research 
was the ability to look back and say how much of their blood content is actually Norse. Uh, and it turns out that men in Iceland are 80% descended directly from Vikings uh, that came from, from Norway. 60% um, uh, of women, on the other hand, or 60% of women's DNA comes from the Celtic uh, tribes, um, which then suggests that perhaps the women that came from Iceland didn't come from Norway, um, might have join the route along the way, um, and there's some debate as to whether or not they did that willingly, um, but, uh, but there's the, the, the certainly a, a Celtic uh, feel uh, and, uh, and sense of, um, to the society. Icelanders are also very clear about that history. Um, there's, a, there's a museum just down a block down the road from, from the Canadian Embassy, uh, and it's called 871 plus or minus 2. That's the date of settlement of Iceland. And there is a national debate still on a, you know, whether or not it was 871 or 872 or maybe 873, but it certainly happened between 871 and 873. Uh, and there will be uh, you know, kitchen table, you know, dining table discussions. Like, you imagine uh, our kind of Thanksgiving drama, you know, family uh, discussions. Well, in Iceland, they have arguments at the dining room table about which fjord their ancestors landed in, in was it 930 or was it 934, and which one was it, and which boat did they come off, and which fjord in Norway did they come from. Uh, you know, so they have a sense of, uh, of, of who they are and where they come from, which astounds the average Canadian. I mean, every Icelander asks you when you, you know, start getting to know them, where do you come from? Like, you're Canadian, but, but who are you? Where, where do your ancestors come from? And I say, well, it's a British, you know, Anglo, Irish, Scottish, 1810s. And 1810s, isn't that just your great-grandfather? <laughs> mm, you know, I, I really, I can't go much beyond the 1810s and, uh, and, uh, and the, the settlement of southern Ontario. You know, they say, well, where did those people come from? And where, I mean, you lived in the UK for three years. Didn't you go and see where, the, where they came from, where your people came from? No. Um, so so there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a sense of self that grows out of that, I think. Um, they, have, uh, they are proud of the fact they have the oldest continuous uh, parliament uh, in the world, uh, founded in the year 930 in Thingvellir, which is... Uh, an area just outside of, uh, of Reykjavik, although I have to put a big parenthesis because we can't, we've become very good friends with the Faroese uh, since arriving in Iceland. And if, you, if, you don't, um, if you've never heard of the Faroe Islands, it would be a surprise. Uh, they're, they're tiny um, uh, and they're uh, sort of halfway between the Shetlands and Iceland. Um, the Faroese will tell the story that, uh, that actually the Vikings set out to go to the Faroes and the poor mariners and, and the sailors that didn't, you know, that got lost went to Iceland because they missed the pharaohs um, and those who knew where they were going went to the pharaohs and stayed with the pharaohs. Uh, they would claim uh, that they have the oldest continuous uh, parliament because it was founded in 926. Um, so, uh, so they're also um, very confident as a democracy, as a people. These are, the, this, the, the, you know, this was a group of uh, chieftains who would come from all parts of Iceland um, uh, once a year to Thingvellir to, um, uh, to read out uh, the laws. All of the laws would be, would be, uh, would be publicly pronounced by the, the only uh, paid member of the, 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 the staff, was the speaker, the law speaker. And each year he would recite one third of the of all of the laws of Iceland, so within three years you'd hear all of them to remind everybody in society what the what the ground rules were, uh, and it was also a court and they uh, sentenced people. But this was a place where um, where women chieftains uh, could represent their region. Uh, so in 930, there was already an acceptance that a powerful woman could be a powerful woman, um, and and this has has echoes then. Uh, you know, that come in, into their society today. They know, they know um, who they are. Uh, they're a hardy and able uh, people. Uh, they, uh, they thrive uh, against adversity. Um, they're stubbornly independent. 
um, but pr remarkably pragmatic. Um, uh, they're able to seize opportunities. Um, they're, they, they've got a lot of similarities, in, in fact, uh, historically and particularly on the economic side in terms of boom and bust cycles to, uh, to Newfoundland. Um, and I don't know how many conversations I've had with Newfoundlanders that sort of look at Iceland and sort of say, okay, where did we go wrong? Because, you know, island, North Atlantic, surrounded by fish, uh, now with some oil and gas, uh, you know. So it's, um, uh, it's interesting. Um, Icelanders um, know, uh, know each other. Um, they, they still don't use last names. Um, Icelanders use, uh, use patronyms. Um, so the uh, phone book is organized by first name. Um, uh, inside a family, uh, if you have um, mother, father, um, son, daughter, you have four separate surnames uh, in the same household. Um, uh, and you are either son or daughter of your father. Um, uh, although in modern, postmodern uh, Iceland, you can now use your mother's uh, name and have a matronym, not a patronym. Uh, uh, and you can even be politically correct and have both your father and your mother's name or your mother and your father's name, uh, but you are certainly daughter or son of some combination of people. So, um, so again, it's, it's that connecting you to, to a, a clan or a lineage. Um, Natalie uh, uh, is uh, Guttormsson, um, uh, which uh, probably when you were in Iceland uh, in the summer um, had to be explained to some Icelanders why you weren't Guttormsdottir. Um, but uh, many um, Icelandic Canadians or Icelanders who emigrated to Canada uh, changed their family name for a Canadianized family name to the first patronym of the, the, the sort of first person that came came to the new world. So I assume your great great grandfather was Gutor, yeah. Gutorson, yeah. which a lot of sort of like John Smith is Jon Jonsson. Uh, they 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 are often named after their their father. Um, it's interesting, in Iceland, um, uh, small talk is not about the weather. Um, it eventually gets to the weather, but much more important than the weather is finding out who you are. Because I really can't have a conversation with you until I understand who you are, which sort of explains why they keep asking me, where do you come from and who are you? But um, uh, they, uh, they'll, they'll say, oh, okay, you say you come from the West Fjords, but which fjord in the West Fjords? Oh, on the left side. Okay, well, um, north or south of this farm and that big rock and this fjord and uh, and then they finally realized that their great great uncle worked on a farm across the road from your great great grandfather now I know who you are now we can have a conversation um, which uh, which is fascinating to me and I uh, and I I, I had a um, uh, a glimpse into one of the reasons recently I I, I thought um, uh, that this was all about getting to know uh, the relationship of clans uh, and sort of in, in the history. Um, but I also uh, figured out, and this, this goes to this idea of independence and this sense that, that you've got to be able to take care of yourself, um, uh, which is a bit of the national psyche uh, in Iceland. Um, uh, that until 100 years ago, Iceland was the poorest country in Europe. Uh, there was no Nordic uh, welfare state uh, um, uh, in, in Iceland. Um, and uh, if, you, uh, if you or your family ran into uh, problems, um, there might be some assistance from the parish, um, but it's going to be pretty me meager. Um, uh, but um, Icelanders, under laws from the, I'll think in the 1700s, uh, were required to take care of sort of kin who, uh, who ran into troubles. Up, into, up until a certain, uh, certain family connection. Um, so part of me thinks that this is also a pragmatic way of, of figuring out, okay, how much do I have to like you? Because if you all of a sudden become uh, orphaned, do I have to take you in? You know, am, am I gonna be your social safety net, net, network? So figuring out your relation to other people then becomes really important in a society that takes care of itself. Um, and just a word on, on, on cousin or kin. Um, when I first got to Iceland, uh, when we first arrived, um, 
the woman at the embassy who was uh, introducing us to people and briefing us, and she would uh, she set up all of these calls for me to go out and, and, uh, and talk to people, and, and people would come uh, to the embassy to repair something or a supplier, and, and she would always say, and that's my cousin, and that's my cousin, and that's my cousin. I'm like, okay. We either have a really bad nepotism problem in this embassy, and maybe that's why they've sent me here, clean this place up, um, or I'm not understanding something. And it became very clear when I, uh, uh, in my Icelandic classes, um, when I realized that the word in Icelandic uh, for cousin is also the word for niece, nephew, aunt, uncle, uh, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, uh, seven times removed. You can be third, fourth, fifth cousins and still be Franca or Frente, and uh, male or female. So, uh, so in essence, you're just saying kin, uh, which, which can be quite far removed. Um, so, so there's this strong sense of self, and and, and how does that uh, help us with with Canada Iceland relations? Well, there's also a, a strong sense of connection to Canada. Uh, you know, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a surprise to Canadians. Um, that there would be uh, an important or, or, or big diaspora of Canadians of Icelandic descent. There are diasporas of Canadians of almost every descent. Um, uh, so the idea that yes, there was a, a large group of, uh, of Canadians uh, of Icelandic descent um, who settled in the late 1800s uh, in, in Gimli, Manitoba and then spread out across the country um, isn't really surprising. But the extent and the scope and the magnitude of that in Icelandic terms, I think is would be a surprise for Canadians. Um, between 1875 uh, and 1905, so within two years of a major uh, um, volcanic eruption in the northeast of Iceland that uh, essentially collapsed crops uh, in the north. Um, and in the context of climate change, interesting to note, this happened at the same time as three successive years where all of the fjords of the north of Iceland um, didn't thaw. So the winter ice, uh, which is, is rare these days at all, uh, actually kept the fishing fleet in port for the entire year, for three years in a row, at the same time as uh, sheep farming collapsed. Um, so basically, you have the Irish potato famine happening in Iceland. Uh, in a space of 25 years, a third of the country leaves Iceland first major migration since the arrival of, uh, uh, of um, the Vikings a thousand years before. Um, and almost all of them went to Gimli, or started in Gimli or in Manitoba and then spread out from there. Um, so the fact that there are some 200, 250,000 Canadians uh, now uh, that are estimated uh, to be of Icelandic descent, um, uh, when there are only 330,000 Icelanders alive, uh, and when there are where there are, when there are only um, uh, if you count uh, this other statistic that I love, if you count every Icelander ever born, so go back to 871, and every one that was born since the settlement, you don't get to a million, and there's 250,000 living in Canada, or at least cousins living in Canada, so. Western Icelanders, or Vestir Islandingur, which we have two examples of here. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, you're both FBI, right? Full-blooded uh, Icelandic? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, well, um, uh, the the Vestir the, Islandingur, the or the Western Icelanders, um, are very much part of the, the, the sort of psyche or, or um, national um, sense of self. Uh, in Iceland, so the connection to Canada is a logical one. It's a it's a connection of cousins. Um, it's not uh, you know it's not an overstatement to to say that you know we meet new people in Iceland um, and they ask you, do you know my cousin in Gimli, or do you know my cousin who's the you know grandson of my great grandfather's brother who went to Gimli, um, and you start thinking, okay, it's freaky, but. When you start, when you put it in that, in that big context, um, so so they 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 see us as cousins, uh, natural partners. Um, uh, they also know uh, that they're a they're a small society. Um, uh, their their self awareness uh, is linked to uh, to the importance of culture in Iceland. 
um, uh, when you're in Iceland, you're surrounded by it. Um, this is the country of the sagas. Um, this is the country that gave, gave the word saga to the English language, um, but um, has an oral tradition, um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years uh, of, of people um, trying to survive uh, harsh winters living in uh, sod-built uh, sod uh, huts um, or um, homesteads uh, through long, long dark nights uh, where um, they were all very literate. Uh, every family that came to Iceland, uh, sorry, that came to Canada from Iceland, uh, had two trunks, one with clo clothing and implements and also uh, other things, and one full of books. Um, they were the first, uh, I'm sure, one of the first uh, immigrant groups to Canada to come almost ent entirely literate. Um, uh, they, um, so so the, the, the place of, of poetry and literature uh, in the society is, uh, is amazing. Um, so for a country like Canada that produces some great literature uh, and some great authors that are translated uh, around the world, um, there's another uh, uh, area of, uh, of connection. Icelanders um, translate more books uh, and literature into Icelandic than any other country, uh, any other language in the world, into their own language. And they translate more uh, literature of their own language into, into other languages than any other country in the world. Um, the number one Christmas gift in Iceland is a book. Um, the, uh, the most important thing that you can have written on your tombstone, in a country where on your tombstones it says what you did, you, it, it will say teacher, it will say doctor, it will say uh, ship captain. Um, the most important thing you could have written on your tombstone is poet. There are prime ministers and presidents in the, uh, the graveyard, which is beside our house uh, in, in Reykjavik. Um, whose families have chosen not to put prime minister or president on their tombstone because they were a poet, and that's more important. So the, 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 the role of the arts um, uh, is, really, is really important. Um, music is, is a, uh, the dynamism of, of what's going on in music in Iceland is, is, is amazing. Um, uh, the, uh, where was I, this is all about, oh God, I'm on the first, on the first, uh, first point. <laughs> That's good. Um, so, uh, so the, this sort of sense of sense of self awareness um, uh, is really important. Their former colony, uh, their struggle to survive uh, as a separate co uh, culture um, uh, with a colonial master thousands of miles away, um, uh, eventually founding their own independent republic. I think most uh, Canadians would be surprised to know that Iceland's only independent since 1944. Uh, before that, they were part of the, the Danish uh, kingdom. Um, and in fact, very much like Canada, until 1944, from 1919 to 1944, they had a governor general uh, who represented uh, the king uh, of Denmark uh, in, in Iceland, but with its own parliament in Iceland. Um, so they're, 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 they're young in that sense of, of, of holding on to their, their sense of self and independence. Um, the second is they have a really clear sense uh, of their place uh, in the world, uh, of uh, their place both in, in terms of the land and the sea, um, but also their relative place uh, in the world. Uh, they're obviously part of the Nordic family, um, both historically, we talked about the, 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 the settlement of, uh, of Norsemen or the, uh, the Vikings, um, and geographically. Um, their nearest uh, geographical neighbors uh, would be Greenland, and uh, uh, Norway uh, or the Faroe, Faroe Islands. Um, uh, they see themselves in a way as Nordics, but with one foot in North America, or at least one <coughs> foot striding the, uh, the, the North Atlantic Ridge, uh, the tectonic plates which, uh, which actually uh, come to the surface of the Atlantic uh, only in Iceland. Um, uh, so they, they, they sort of see themselves uh, as Nordic, but North American in, in a way, uh, or at least in, in spirit uh, as well. Uh, the Nordics is also uh, a concept which I think um, uh, people often outside of um, the Nordics um, uh, think as uniform. Um, but really, uh, in most of our minds, we think Nordics equals Scandinavia. Uh, and when we think Scandinavia, we're really thinking about a Sweden and Norway. Um, uh, but in fact, uh, Scandinavia is only Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. Uh, the Nordics uh, add Iceland and, uh, and Finland to that group. Um, and the, the outliers of that, that group are Iceland and Finland. Um, um, 
which are uh, a little bit more unique. Um, they've had to be a bit more dynamic uh, than, uh, than their, some of their neighbors, uh, as I said, uh, being the, the poorest country in Europe until only about 100 years ago. Um, <clears throat> much more isolated, um, couldn't count uh, uh, on outsiders necessarily. Um, even their Danish colonial masters, uh, which may have provided uh, governance, but uh, certainly not much in terms of advancement and prosperity. Um, uh, it's interesting for us uh, now uh, at the embassy, um, in terms of opportunities for Canada, uh, we look at the Nordics as, a, as, one, as one region. Um, we try to work a lot between, all of us have small embassies in the five uh, Nordic capitals. Um, but uh, the countries themselves have, they, as I say, the sh shared history, uh, strong commitment to democratic uh, institutions, values, um, but they're valuable commercial partners for Canada. Uh, together they represent a larger market for Canada than France, Spain, or Italy. Uh, most people wouldn't uh, imagine that. Uh, in the same fashion, Nordic countries are a huge, important source uh, of investment in Canada. Um, <clears throat> In, in 2013, the five Nordic countries combined were responsible for $10 billion of investment stocks in Canada, which is about 17 times the value of, uh, of investment from Spain or nine times the value of investment from Italy. Um, so in a sense, the Nordics as a group are one of our most important trading partners in Europe. Um, and with a strong focus on R&D in some of the areas that matter most to, uh, to a modern northern economy in terms of sustain sustainability, uh, sustainable technologies, renewable energy, uh, sustainable north, uh, natural resources extraction, particularly in northern environments, um, there's a lot that we can do together. Um, in a broader sense, uh, Iceland understands its place in the world. Um, as a small state, uh, they have uh, probably better than most uh, honed their ability to punch above their weight. Um, I used to, when I was studying here, uh, you know, you read a lot about um, Canada being a uh, middle power, or Canada punching above its weight at the UN or, or things like that. Um, but, but Iceland certainly does that. Um, and it's uh, perhaps in a, in a more marked way uh, than, than Canada does, being a hundred times smaller. Um, <coughs> They're very strategic in, in their choice of engagements. Uh, this is a country whose foreign ministry has 150 people. That's the foreign ministry and the aid agency rolled into one. Uh, we combined uh, CETA and foreign affairs uh, over the last two years. We've been amalgamating uh, our, uh, our foreign um, uh, ministry, if you will, uh, to, to foreign, uh, foreign relations aid and uh, trade uh, and we have over 10,000 employees um, and we're represented in 150 countries around the world. Um, uh, Iceland has 150 people uh, and so they have to be careful about where they choose uh, to engage. Um, so they're very effective at using multilateral uh, agencies or multilateral fora uh, to leverage their, uh, their influence. They choose those based on their interests and the Arctic uh, is probably the best example of that. Um, they use it to leverage their relationships with other countries. Um, you look at the, the, the growing relationship they have with China uh, and how they've used their uh, membership in the Arctic Council where everything happens by, by consensus, which essentially gives Iceland, a country of 300,000 people, a veto uh, uh, over anything that Russia or the United States wants to do in the Arctic. Um, uh, and knowing that, that China and, and a whole bunch of other countries in the world are interested in what's going on in the Arctic, in a time, time of climate change, in a time of, uh, uh, of uh, race for, for resources, all sorts of things that you hear written uh, in the press, um, even if they're not accurate. Um, uh, but they're very strategic in, in deciding that they're going to use their position uh, to achieve other, uh, other goals um, that are in their interests. Um, one thing that's interesting in the Arctic side uh, that again shows, uh, shows a, a, a strength of, of pragmatism, um, <clears throat> the president of Iceland, um, President, Pres president Grimson, he, uh, he has long um, been an advocate of the Arctic, the importance of the Arctic, the importance of people talking about the Arctic and bringing people together uh, to talk about uh, the challenges in the Arctic. Um, 
And uh, it was the, actually the topic of our very first conversation when I presented credentials, uh, you know, within five days of arriving in Iceland. Uh, he wanted to talk about how were we going to create um, a, a, a place or a space where the world could come uh, and talk about the Arctic, not just the, the Arctic Council and its agenda, uh, which of course Iceland is fully supportive of. Um, and so his vision has turned into uh, an annual conference uh, which is called the Arctic Circle, which happens in, in Iceland now every October. And this year was the third uh, time it happened. Um, and uh, this year, 1,900 delegates, it started at 1,400, then 1,600, then 1,900 this year uh, from over 60 countries in the world, uh, came to Iceland for four days. Um, it, it's become uh, referred to as the Davos of the Arctic. Um, uh, and it's really uh, a wide open democratic space, very much in the Icelandic tradition of uh, bringing people together once a year to talk about anything they want on that one topic, sort of going back to their uh, their traditions of, uh, of open dialogue at the Althingi, um, uh, where they founded their parliament. Um, their, their confidence in, in, in being able to, to say, we're going to host the world, and they're all going to come to Reykjavik. And a lot of us three years ago said, oh, well, we'll see how many people show up. Uh, and three years later, um, you know, <clears throat> the president of France uh, gave, a, gave the keynote uh, address a month before uh, hosting the world in, in Paris, and he drew direct lines between the climate change agenda and what's going on in the Arctic. Um, so he saw that as the platform to reaching out and making a climate change statement about the Arctic. And I think that says something about Iceland's ability um, to, uh, by the strength of their ideas, uh, uh, attract, uh, attract the outside world. Um, their, their sense of place comes with a, an incredible attachment to the land. Um, you've all seen uh, Iceland Air's very successful uh, marketing campaigns of mountains and the sea and geysers and waterfalls and, uh, and, and those are all wonderful tourism attractions. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, but they, they also uh, play a big part in, uh, in the average Icelander's life. Um, Icelanders like to get out in nature. Um, uh, I was saying before that Iceland has a very uh, small uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In fact, most of government is fairly small and, uh, um, and not uh, heavily layered, um, like we have in a federation. Um, uh, they, uh, so they're, they're, they're consequently on the, on the challenging side, they have a challenge with long-term planning. Um, there's no one at the foreign ministry that I can call and say, okay, I want to talk now about what we want to do in nine months with you when I might have a minister coming through. They said, oh, talk to us in the summer. Um, and then when you call them in the summer, well, mm, we're working on, talk to us in September. Um, they're, they're, they're busy delivering next week and being very pragmatic about next week uh, and don't really have time for, for, for a lot of long-term planning. The one thing, though, I would say that Icelanders have huge amount of time uh, for long-term planning is their summer holidays. Um, uh, if you are planning to go to Iceland, uh, I just saw an article last week that said, uh, is it possible that Iceland will be sold out this summer? Uh, within the next month. So uh, the idea is if you are going to buy a plane ticket to Iceland <clears throat> after, say, April 1st, and you haven't bought your arrange your hotel uh, accommodations or your camping accommodations or whatever accommodations before you buy the plane ticket, you might <laughs> have to rethink that uh, or uh, think about how you feel uh, tenting uh, in a climate um, that is windy, rainy, and rarely above 12 degrees in the, in the summer. Um, so anyway, the, uh, they, they are very attractive right now for, for all sorts of great tourism reasons and, and it's driving their economy. Um, they're hugely proud of their renewable energy. Um, Iceland uh, is, uh, is really a green uh, country. Um, their geothermal uh, capacity uh, not only creates hot springs that everybody likes to come and, and bathe in, um, but it's, uh, it's also been a way of defining them to the world and to themselves. Um, but that decision to focus on geothermal wasn't an easy one. Uh, during the OPEC crisis, uh, about 90% of, uh, of Iceland's energy uh, needs were met by imported um, fuel. So fuel oil uh, and diesel uh, used for um, uh, power generation, for home heating. Uh, it wasn't until the 70s they decided 
uh, <clears throat> that they would take a gamble, and it was a heated debate in Parliament, uh, to gamble on an unproven technology of geothermal. Uh, and now, you know, 25 years later, or 35 years later, 40 years later, um, dating myself. Uh, they're now the world leaders in, in geothermal. Uh, they produce uh, about 30% of their uh, electricity uh, from geothermal, 33% of their electricity from ge geothermal. Uh, the, the rest of it, 67%, is hydro. Um, uh, so fully renewable in terms of their electricity generation. Um, about 90% of homes uh, in Iceland uh, are uh, heated with uh, hot water, uh, also derived from the same geothermal power plants. Um, so the average Icelander, and this is in a northern climate, um, the average Iceland, Icelandic home uh, gets one energy bill per month, uh, and that supplies their electricity, uh, their hot water for heating their house, that comes in, in, in tubes from, uh, from, the, from the plant or pipelines, uh, and supplies their hot water and their cold water in their taps, uh, and all of that comes to about $50 a month in a northern climate that has eight months of winter. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of, the investment bonanza that that gamble uh, in, in the 1970s uh, took is, is, is really paid off. And so that creates a huge opportunity for us uh, as Canadians. As we're looking um, uh, at what, uh, what's going on in the world, where are the partners that Canada can work uh, together with uh, to, to, to build a low economy, uh, low, co low carbon economy for Canada and for the world in the future, um, <coughs> there's a lot of uh, interesting things we can do together. There's a small uh, Canadian company uh, that came and talked to us at the embassy uh, from Toronto, three young guys, uh, all uh, recent graduates, um, uh, one geophysicist, one uh, finance guy, and one PR guy, uh, or CEO. Uh, and basically what they've decided to do is that Canada is world leader in mining, and we're mining all around the world, uh, and all sorts of Canadian mine, mining companies go into developing countries. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Canadian mining industry is, has, has come leaps and bounds uh, and is doing all sorts of good things for corporate social, social responsibility. But after a 25-year mine in a, in a place like Latin America or in, uh, in Africa, they're typically leaving at the end of that, that period without having provided much in terms of lasting legacy for the region other than, uh, than some jobs along the way um, and probably some pollution along the way. Um, this company says, well, actually, they don't need to create hydro dams. They don't need to cut down rainforests to bring in uh, electricity from 1,000 miles away. Um, in, and they've mapped out the areas in the world where these mining opportunities coincide with geothermal opportunities. So they will take an Icelandic partner and they will go to the Canadian mining company and say, listen, you're going to spend a billion dollars on this mining project, $100 million, uh, sorry, $250 million of that is going to be on your energy needs. For $100 million, we can build uh, and supply you 10 years of geothermal power, which will be green and which will be left there for the, the country and the population after you leave. Um, and save you a, a big whack of, uh, of cash for your bottom line. So there's some really interesting things that together Canadians uh, and Icelanders can do in other places in the world. Um, there's uh, uh, an Icelandic company called Green Cloud uh, that we're working with at the embassy to try and, uh, and bring them to invest in Canada. Um, they, their model is, is really simple. Uh, the world is moving from uh, an industrial uh, based economy to an information uh, age. Um, <clears throat> and the last thing that this shift from uh, a carbon producing economy to an info elect electronic age should do is create a bigger carbon footprint than what it's trying to replace. Uh, and unfortunately, that's what's happening in a lot of uh, places around the world. As the need for cloud computing uh, increases and the need for um, data farms increases, uh, we're drawing huge amounts of power um, to cool buildings um, and to, dr dr to drive the, those data centers to hold Amazon's uh, you know, 
cloud and to hold Microsoft's cloud and Google's cloud and all of these, uh, these places where our, our online information is stored. Iceland uh, has a whole bunch of space where they can put up big, huge warehouses with very little uh, infrastructure needed, open the door because they don't need to air condition anything pretty well all year, uh, all year long, and only use 100% renewable energy. So it's a, it's, a, it's a combination which is really appealing uh, and is attracting clients from around the world. Of course, they're not very close to the big uh, places where, where those computing needs are. Uh, and so they're looking for other grids and networks of electric generation that are minimum 97% uh, renewable. And there are some provinces in Canada where the grids are 97% uh, are renewable. Um, what does all that mean? Uh, great uh, confidence in themselves, uh, from, driven from, uh, from a sense of, of who they are, where they come from, and, and of the space that they inhabit. Um, it means that confidence in their culture, in their values, in their abilities, um, to their common cause of building that, that society uh, against all odds. Um, uh, it, it means that they have a strength of, uh, of values which align very closely to, to Canadian values, democracy, inv individual freedom, uh, peaceful society, respect for each other's rights. Uh, Iceland's a human rights leader, um, uh, particularly uh, on uh, LG, uh, LG, LGBTI uh, rights uh, and gender equality. Um, I was honored last year to be the first openly gay uh, ambassador in Iceland, uh, to Iceland to speak at the annual Pride Festival uh, opening in, in, in Reykjavik. Um, and, and that may seem, seem uh, inconsequential, but um, uh, in Iceland there are two big national uh, festivals uh, where practically the entire country comes out. One is Culture Night uh, in, in, in August, uh, where they have a white night of, uh, of, of about 800 cultural events that happen. And the other is Pride. Uh, Pride Festival uh, is attended by 110, 120,000 people uh, in a country of 330. Um, so it's a pretty big uh, celebration and people of all walks of life come out uh, in all ages and, and, and family. Um, and Brian and I were the first uh, openly gay uh, ambassadorial cu couple to march uh, in the parade. Um, and it's not that impressive, uh, but at the same time, when we arrived in Iceland, we were uh, probably the first openly gay uh, ambassadorial couple to be uh, accredited to a country led by the world's first openly gay lesbian prime minister. Um, and that, I think, uh, says something about where Iceland is uh, in terms of, uh, of diversity. Gender equality, uh, obviously, uh, leaders, um, people may remember Vigdis Finnbogadottir, who uh, was the first uh, um, democratically elected uh, president or head of state in the world. Uh, she just, uh, we just celebrated the 35th anniversary of her, uh, her election this year. Um, <clears throat> and this year also was the 100th anniversary of uh, women's suffrage uh, in Iceland. And interestingly, connecting back to the Western Iceland, Western Islander uh, Manitoba connection, suffrage, women's suffrage in Canada got a huge boost from the suffrage movement in Winnipeg, uh, which was largely driven by Icelandic Canadians, who the year before it became big uh, movement in, uh, in uh, Manitoba had already uh, won that battle in Iceland. Um, so those connections were already there then. Uh, our Prime Minister just last week talked about the world um, uh, needing more men uh, who were prepared to call themselves fem feminists. Um, <clears throat> well, Iceland is, uh, is actually leading an initiative at the UN uh, with Guyana. Uh, so this is again showing two small, small countries punching above their weight on the international stage um, that promotes uh, just that. Uh, it's called the He for She uh, movement and it's uh, Iceland organized the barbershop conference last, uh, last January, uh, which essentially was a conference of the UN. Um, it, it got some criticism, um, but that was for men to talk about the importance of gender equality. Um, uh, and that, that, that may sound counterintuitive, but um, you know, we often, in all sorts of international fora, end up going to events where you're talking to the converted, 
Um, and, uh, and so the people that need to be talked to about gender equality are not women, uh, but they're men. Um, and Iceland is, uh, is leading the way on that, and I think that, that gives us another good area where we can um, work together. Um, there's lots more I could say, uh, but I'll stop there, because uh, Brian's eyes are already... <laughs> so, a bit of jet lag, but uh, also because he's like, okay, I've heard this a thousand times. Um, but I have lots of uh, more I could say. But but you know, Canada um, and Iceland, uh, I think uh, um, uh, we're at a moment where um, uh, two years ago, when the when the Icelandic government was elected, um, they elected the youngest uh, democratically elected prime minister on the planet. He's now been overtaken by the president, prime minister of Luxembourg, I think. Um, but he was 38 uh, when he got elected. Um, <clears throat> uh, they uh, turned their backs on, on the, the, the project to join the EU uh, and very specifically uh, pivoted north and west uh, and made uh, Arctic foreign policy and economic relations uh, and strengthened public political relations with Canada and the United States, um, their number one uh, foreign policy uh, priority. Um, so I think <clears throat> given those uh, opportunities, uh, given those, uh, that set of characteristics that makes Iceland what it is and makes Iceland able to uh, play the role in the world that it does, um, that Canada, uh, um, Canada would be very well placed to take advantage of this opportunity of the, the hand being outstretched uh, towards Canada um, to, to find in Iceland uh, a strategic partner um, that we could uh, do bigger and better things with. Uh, I was, uh, uh, I tried to be an active participant of, uh, of TIP. Um, it's what attracted me to Trent, the Trent International Program. Um, uh, I did my third year um, studies abroad uh, at the University of Granada in the south of Spain, um, and that really cemented in my mind uh, that I wanted an international life. Um, and, uh, and so I owe that to Trent, uh, and it's great to, to be back. Um, when I was thinking tonight um, about, about speaking, uh, I, um, uh, I, saw, I saw this, this title that, that <laughs> Heather and I vaguely remember having this conversation a few months back and saying, oh, put something vague so I can say anything. Um, Canada and the International North, that sounds good. Um, uh, the, um, um, when I was thinking about, uh, about Trent and about being back here, um, uh, it's, it, it's funny, I, uh, the thought that came to mind um, was this slogan that was on uh, one of the Trent posters uh, that came out uh, while I was here, so it must have come out around in the early 90s. Um, uh, and it, uh, and uh, it, it uh, has often come back to me. Um, and then today, I saw it on the wall, framed on the wall in the, uh, in the president's office. Um, and I was going to paraphrase from it, but I, but I can actually quote it uh, now, uh, since I, I, I was going to scribble it down, but I realized that this is a university, and now uh, people have technology, and so I used Brian's phone and just took a picture of it. Uh, and, uh, and it says the following. It says, at Trent, we believe that the quality of the future depends on two environments, the natural environment in which we live and the human environment in which we learn. Uh, it's a great photo of, uh, uh, of the river uh, and the library. Um, and, um, and that uh, thought has actually stayed uh, with me uh, a lot. Um, it's great to be back at Trent, um, and uh, it's great to be back at, uh, at Trail College, which for someone who's a proud uh, lady in graduate is, uh, is something to say. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it's great to be, to be standing not far from where my, probably my most challenging, at the same time, most um, uh, rewarding and favorite class uh, in all my years at Trent took place. Um, uh, some of you might remember um, Magnus Gunther, who was uh, um, a longtime um, professor of international political economy. Um, we called him God uh, at the time. Um, although we, we, there were two professors that we called God, um, one uh, was him in the international uh, uh, sphere, and the other was John Wadlin, um, who, uh, who all of you who are involved in Canadian studies will know. Um, and, uh, and I remember I, 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 I saw John uh, today, I actually met him for the first time because I uh, somehow went through four years at Trent without having a class with John Wadlin um, when everybody in my circle of friends uh, was studying Canadian studies and, 
uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, sort of worshipping the ground that he, he walked on. Um, so it was great to see him, him today too. Um, but I never uh, would have thought uh, back in 1991 um, that 25 years later I would be here uh, as a Canadian ambassador um, giving a talk. So it's, uh, it's great, um, uh, great to be here. Um, a big thank you to Professor Heather Nickel. Um, for inviting my partner Brian and, uh, and me to come to Trent this week. Um, and of course to the Frost Centre uh, and the Roberta Bondar uh, Fund for giving us the chance to come back to Trent. Um, I love my time at Trent. Um, it, uh, it really, um, I, I was sad when it ended. It certainly changed my life um, uh, over the years. Um, and, uh, and I've think, been thinking a lot about it in, in terms of thinking about Iceland. Um, uh, you know, I think we've been very fortunate, uh, Brian and I, to have lived in a place um, where I think uh, the, the, the strength of the country uh, and the society um, that its people have built lies very much um, in uh, an in-depth, if sometimes unconscious, uh, knowledge of both their geography and their humanity. Um, but I'm getting ahead of myself. That's sort of my big message for the, the night. Iceland does that well, and we should uh, take advantage of that, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll uh, dial back a bit uh, and tell you a little bit about our time in Iceland. And, and, and um, It's now three, well, it's coming on four years ago when uh, uh, we were in Ottawa, uh, back in Ottawa for one short year after being abroad for, uh, for six. Uh, in far flung, far flung, flung places, um, and um, and really, uh, we didn't expect to 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 uh, to be posted uh, again. We thought we'd be, be in Ottawa for a while, and um, uh, and the opening in, in Iceland uh, came up somewhat unexpectedly, and and, and uh, I was asked to consider whether or not uh, I would serve as, as Canada's ambassador uh, in Iceland. Of course, when you join the Foreign Service. Um, at least uh, in my case as a political officer, um, there is sort of only one objective to the career and that's someday to be fortunate enough to, 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 to be uh, in the right place at the right time with the right skills and the right language or whatever happens to be your lucky uh, mix uh, to, be, to be asked to be Canada's uh, representative. Um, so it was very exciting. Um, uh, I knew a place in the north um, Brian, uh, most of, uh, of, of his life growing up in, in, in what are now all three territories in, uh, in, in the north of Canada. Myself, um, sort of having a divided childhood between Ottawa uh, and Yellowknife, um, but uh, then professionally uh, being able to, to, to visit probably more than half of the, the communities uh, um, that make up the, the three territories. It, it really um, uh, was a, an opportunity uh, to uh, to work in a policy area, to, to be out promoting um, uh, uh, a priority for the, for Canada that had some personal connection, um, uh, and, uh, and 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 I always think that you um, you're more authentic and more uh, real in your ability to communicate um, if uh, if that's based in some personal experience. So um, so we arrived just as Canada was preparing the chairmanship. Minister Aglukak was the first. Uh, Minister to visit us uh, in in Reykjavik. Actually, two and a half months after we arrived, she is the, was the first minister to visit uh, Iceland in uh, in five or six years. Uh, so it was a, it was an exciting time um, uh, to be uh, ambassador in, in Reykjavik. Um, it seemed uh, that uh, that a week didn't go by that there wasn't something focused on the Arctic happening uh, uh, in Iceland. Um, we were, um, we were preparing the chairmanship, took over the chairmanship in the spring of, uh, of 2013, and as many of you uh, will um, have seen, uh, Canada's agenda uh, came under the theme of development for the people of the North, uh, which was uh, an agenda that Iceland fully embraced, well, all of the, uh, the Canada's uh, Arctic partners did, it's the, the, the nature of consensus at the Arctic Council, but um, the ideas around this, I knew the place a little bit. Uh, I had been uh, to Iceland uh, 10 years before uh, and absolutely fell in love, fell in love with it. Uh, I was uh, working um, for the Governor General at the time uh, and had been um, with the Governor General uh, 
uh, on state visit uh, to Iceland and therefore had gone a couple of times in advance to prepare the visit um, and, uh, and fell in love with the people, uh, the place, uh, the, the, the sort of majesty of, uh, of, of, of the physical space which, which Iceland is and I think most first time visitors uh, would say the same. Um, uh, the idea of, uh, of being asked to serve uh, uh, in an Arctic Council capital, just as Canada was taking on the chairmanship of the Arctic Council, uh, was very exciting. Um, it's, uh, it's always interesting when you're in the Foreign Service because you have this push and pull between wanting to be somewhere interesting, exciting, uh, and sometimes I think if you're off the beaten track, it's better because Ottawa's not breathing down your neck, and uh, you can actually be Captain Canada out there, you know, doing good on the world stage um, uh, without, you know, too many people paying much attention back home. Um, but uh, but there's also this pull of uh, of going to places that are high on uh, on the priority list uh, at home. Uh, so going to to a place like Afghanistan. Um, when it was the, the government's highest foreign policy priority, and then uh, being able to go to Iceland just as we were taking the chairmanship of the Arctic Council, I thought that was pretty exciting. Um, also, I think for Brian and I uh, as well, um, for us uh, being able to serve uh, in an Arctic uh, um, place um, was pers personally satisfying. Um, both of us uh, have ties to the North. Um, and experience living um, and working 